You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. New new cards, 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 new new cards. All right. Yep, nailed it. Thanks, Elton, for that classic. Didn't know you wrote about Commander 2019, because that's what we're talking about today on the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Yes, Commander Christmas is here. We've talked about all the reprints. We've talked about all the new legendary creatures. And now... Oh, it's time to dive in. Yep, deep dive on all every single one of the new non-legendary cards from Commander 2019. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be saying which we think are awesome, which we think are duds. You're going to want to pick up a bunch of these cards if you're buying singles or if you're just pre-ordering or ordering. At this point, actually, you're ordering yep. the pre-con decks in any way, shape, or form. You really should go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone because you're going to get this stuff anyway, and you may as well support Game Nights, this podcast, all of our content while you're doing that. And there's also a special promotion going on. That's right. Exclusive to Card Kingdom. If you order any of the Commander 2019 sealed product with your order in the mail, you're going to get a special code that unlocks four backgrounds in our Lifelinker app that are themed color backgrounds to all of the decks this year for Commander 2019, which is really cool. Yeah, it's a limited time offer, so make sure that you get in there, get your order set sooner rather than later so you can get that code. Also, while you're there or really anywhere you're at, you should check out Ultra Pro products. They have all of the play mats, mm -hmm. deck boxes, mm -hmm. sleeves that are themed around the Commander 2019 stuff. So if you build the Anya deck, you can also get the Anya play mat, the Anya deck box. Oh, he's got them right there. The Anya sleeves. You look really cool when you have a deck that is totally... I look cool? Well, no, not you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Dang, <laughs> rough. <laughs> that all came out wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but you, you I can you. look really cool exactly. out there yeah. uh, if you just use the Ultra Pro stuff and really spice up your battlefield. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and also, hopefully, see you, uh, or we will have seen you at uh, GP Vegas, where I hope a lot of you brought that stuff and we oh, right. it. Yeah, yeah. This is gonna air after Vegas, but we're recording it before. Yep. Uh, and a big shout out as well to our. <laughs> the, the way you can support us another way another way you can support us is that patreon.com slash command zone uh, you get to chat with Josh and I on discord you get to see game nights episodes early you get just a nice sneak peek behind the scenes and, inter and interact with us and we shout out one lucky patron every single episode so this week's episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to Matt Flucher Matt Matt you rock your last name is almost future yeah but it's actually kind of cooler in a way Flucher's Flucher. made of <laughs> Virtual insane. Wow, okay. they get two songs yeah, in yeah, yeah. Jamiroquai too? <laughs> yeah, nice. Jamiroquai. Yeah, I was trying to think of the band name. Yeah. So I knew it was a funny one. All right. <laughs> um, well, let's just get into it here. We're going to go through each and every single one of the non-reprint, non-legendary cards in Commander 2019. Uh, there are a lot, so strap in. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch. I want to say something at the start here. Because usually we begin the discussion with the new cycles of cards. Yep. And this year they did something I don't think they've ever done. Oh, yeah. There's not a cycle. Because last year there was like the storm cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've had like the tempt with cycle right, and the right, right, joint right. forces cycles and all these. They usually have a couple of cycles. And this year they're really, there's like one mini cycle that's like each of the face commander's names is on a card. But right. those cards don't share. Like last year they did that. And they all and had something in common. A, they were a big keyword. sorceries that cost a lot of mana. Yeah. These are not, the, the one's a creature, one's like an enchantment. Like it's, it, it, there's not an obvious cycle. For I the think it's actually maybe a good thing because a lot of the times in the past, those cycles, one of the five were good. Yeah. But now we just have a bunch of new cards that kind of span the whole gamut of build arounds. And when, when we were putting this outline together, we have more cards in the like things that work with this than I think we've ever had in one of these set reviews before. Yeah, there's a bunch of really interesting stuff. This first one has a lot of people talking. Yeah. We're starting off with red, of course. It's Dockside Extortionist. It's a goblin pirate for one and a red. He's a one-two. When Dockside Extortionist enters the battlefield, create X treasure tokens, Josh is already celebrating, where X is the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. Hey, it's red ramp. ramp. Yeah. I mean, it's conditional, and I think there's a whole bunch of stuff you got to think about this card, like how many artifacts do you see early in games mm -hmm. in your meta, which I'd say, well, most games, if you play this on turn two, Maybe get one or right. two, yeah. Yeah. 
three or turn three or four, they'll starts to look a lot better. I would I would find it hard to believe you're not going to get at least three by turn three or four. Yeah, I think this is best around turn five and six even that can jump you to the turn nine point, which we always say is like a really pivotal mana point to be at. Um, I think this card's really good if you can blink it uh, yeah, or yeah. if you can clone it. A couple of other cards that we thought worked well with it. Revel and Riches, just one of those interesting alternate win conditions. There's Michael Synth Lattice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Turn everybody's stuff into artifacts and then play this. Two mana get like 80 <laughs> mana. Like, that's pretty sweet. Actually, that's like a win the game thing, right? Yeah. If you have Michael Synth. Michael Synth. I mean, has a lot itself. of ways to do yeah, that, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, but that's pretty good. Uh, Brutaclad, one of... Brutaclad! Uh, yeah. Uh, again, it's like, a, it, this is just a way to make a lot of things, and it, turning all of your artifacts into treasures is also kind of funny too, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have uh, Kiki Jiki down here, which I actually like, because yeah. you just make a copy of Dockside Extortionist, like, every turn, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like a mini... As Kiki Jiki combos go, not yeah, the yeah, best not, one. Not the best one. It's value. You get you get some uh, some ramp out of it. Sometimes you just need to get some ramp, too. Mm -hmm. um, I actually found this card when I was looking for anti-treasure tech. You're like, I'm going to be playing against this. I need to know how to stop it. Yeah, and there's an interesting one in Abzan called Crime and Punishment. And Punishment, the side of it, is X, black, green. So it's destroy each artifact, creature, and enchantment with converted mana cost X. So this is just a token hoser. Oh, so if you go... X is zero, destroys all treasures. Yeah, black, green, all treasures, all, all tokens, tokens. Oh. all things without CMC. But it also this is also a card that can hit artifact creatures and enchantments with CMC Pretty X. Versatile. So very versatile, yeah. And the top part of it is just putting a, um, for three white and a black, you can instead choose a creature and enchantment card from an opponent's graveyard and put it on the battlefield under your control. So interesting card to see. So what do you think about all the chat around Dockside Extortionist? Is it awesome? I think for mono red, it's pretty awesome. Uh, otherwise, you're right. It could it could be a dud sometimes, but I, I, I see this at the very least getting its value most, most times you play it. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. I don't think... This is like as good as rampant growth and two mana rocks because those oh, are at the two mana slot. Yeah, because on turn two, yeah, those are going to ramp you early into something like your commander a turn early. This might do that, but you can't always count on it. Yeah, I it's think also it's a permanent ramp, right? You don't need to worry about the treasures going away. That's a really good point, right? If I only get two treasure tokens, is that even good enough? Because it's a one two. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if you can do some other shenanigans with it, blink it, whatever, then yeah. that's good. But yeah, I think it's a little overrated, being overrated a little bit by the community. If you also have a deck that wants a lot of artifacts in play, Dockside Extortion can sort of get that engine going really quickly. That's true. Like, that just gives you artifacts to use for other yeah, stuff. Yeah, to sack or whatever. What's that one where you can improvise all your non-artifact spells? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. War of Invention? No, 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 no. no, no. I know what you're talking about. Uh, well, I don't know the name, but they'll statuary. put it on screen. Inspiring Statuary. Inspiring Statuary. Oh, Ooh, jeez. Search me. deep Bait into the brain up. banks. <laughs> Get that one out there. <laughs> it's funny how brain the brain works. You got the word statuary from somewhere. Yeah, and I was like, and then uh, reverse engineered inspiring. it. Inspiring. <laughs> I was inspired to come up with the name. Okay, uh, the next card is backdraft hellkite three black, three red red. Sorry, three red red <laughs> for a four four dragon with flying. When it attacks, each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn, and the fla flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's just passed in flames kind of on a creature, right? Yeah, and it's repeatable, mm -hmm. um, assuming you can untap with it or you have a haste enabler for it. But at that point, you it already costs five mana. So I think this would work well if you're able to generate a ton of mana, maybe with a Dockside Extortionist. Yeah, you're right. Even haste enabler doesn't help you too much because how much mana do you have left over to flash things back yeah. the turn you cast it? But if you untap with it, that's a lot of value. It's going to basically, quote unquote, draw you all the cards in your graveyard. Yeah. I mean, one or two of them, however many you turn, can cast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like this card just because, again, for mono red, it's like, cool, more things to do. Any card that you have to attack, to, you don't have to deal combat damage, though. You just have to attack, so that's a little yeah. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But any card like that, it, it makes it a little tough. Oh, you've got, yeah. Mana Geyser. It's a good way to get a lot of mana really quickly. Yeah, because you'll actually net mana probably. Attack with that. Flashback first thing, mana geyser. Get 18, 18 yeah. 20 mana, and now... Or maybe now cast mana geyser, play back draft, swing, play mana geyser again, oh, get tons of mana. Interesting. Yeah, just geyser it up. <laughs> geyser it up. Next up, we have Ignite the Future. Three and a red for a sorcery. And we've seen this effect now coming back to red a few, a few times. Exile the top three cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards. If this spell was cast from a graveyard, you may play cards this way without paying their mana cost. And this has a flashback of seven and a red. Uh, combined with Backdraft Hellkite, the flashback is only four, which is kind of neat. Um, this is like a bit more expensive light up the stage, which is a card that is very dominant in standard. Mm -hmm. uh, a very cheap way for red to just get extra cards. And specifically, this says until the end of your next turn. So you mm -hmm. actually can play this and wait a whole turn cycle and 
play it on your next turn, the cards that you exile. Um, yeah, seems expensive for that effect. Four mana. I get the flashback being expensive because you get to play them without paying their mana cost. Yeah, yeah. But four mana means that you're unlikely to have a bunch of mana left over to play most of the things. Maybe you get a land and like one of those spells. Yeah. But you played Ignite the Future as one of your spells, so you're kind of breaking even if you only play one spell, right? Right. I'm, you're right. You can play it on your next turn also, so you kind of get... It makes it better, but four mana is still, yeah, pretty steep price considering I think a lot of the... Most commanders are around the four mana range anyway, so... And the flashback cost... I mean, at that mana, at that amount of mana, you're doing powerful things no matter what. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of this card. Again, I think for Mono Red, exciting. For the rest of Commander, a little less exciting. Yeah, I don't even know for Mono Red it's that exciting. They got enough ways to draw cards now. Yeah. This next, to- this next one's interesting. Can draw you cards depending. It's <laughs> Anya's Ravager. <laughs> I don't know if I like this card. <laughs> it's two and a red for a 3-3 three, three Vampire Berserker. It says Anya's Ravager attacks each combat if able. And then whenever Anya's Ravager attacks, discard your hand, then draw three cards. And it has a madness cost of one and a red. So hey. it wheels, it does a mini wheel. There's mm-hmm. been some, I think, Chandra's that do this, some other cards that sort of make you discard your hand. And then don't draw back up to seven, draw up to three. Yeah. If you have no cards in hand or less than three cards, this is pretty good. Especially if you can madness it out right before your turn starts or something. Yeah. When we played the pre-cons, uh, I got this out in a game where I basically had, I think, one card in hand. And then it was great because I was just drawing three cards every turn. Yeah. And I could play most of them. So the ones I couldn't were just mostly lands. And But that's not a situation you all you often find yourself in Commander, right? Most Commander decks are built to get a lot of resources and hold, hold like six cards at all times, kind of. Yeah. In which um, case, this is scary. Yeah, unless you're super madness or super madness themed or discard themed, uh, or if you want to give this to someone with a Zedru. It's mm. interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Someone on Reddit also found this really interesting called Ignorant Bliss, which is one in a red for an instant, and you exile all cards from your hand face down at the beginning of your next end step, return those cards to your hand, and draw a card. So you could, like, play that, and then attack with Ony's Ravager, draw three cards, and then you get your hand back plus another card. Interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a reach, but you that's know what? That's a lot to go through <laughs> for one card that's not a legendary, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. I'm kind of off yeah. on his Ravager. I'm a little too. off on the Ravager yeah. as well. Uh, Skyfire Phoenix is the next red card. Two red red for a creature Phoenix with flying and haste for a 3-3. And when you cast your commander, return Skyfire Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, four man for a 3-3 Phoenix is not bad with haste. Um, you're going to want to have this index that player commander a lot. Partner commanders are good, right? Right. If you have a couple of cheap partner commanders, because it'll trigger off in either one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Prosh, Sky Raider of Care, is one of those cards that you want to cast a bunch of times, and you need creatures to sacrifice, so getting Skyfire Phoenix is one more body. Okay. Um, there is uh, Neheb the Eternal, which is one of my favorite decks. When you cast the commander, usually it's really hard because you want to attack with him because his ability is so good to add that extra mana. So now you have a 3-3 haste flyer that will most likely be able to get some damage in. Um, Squee the Immortal is one that people have talked about. I think a lot of people are building decks around Squee, which is yeah. interesting. He's not the greatest commander. But he costs the same every time, so... Yeah, because you can cast from a graveyard or from exile, which is pretty neat. So if you combine this with Skyfire Phoenix, a card like Desecrated Tomb, and then one of the altars, all of a sudden you are creating more cards from your graveyard because of Desecrated Tomb, and you can sack them for more mana, and there are ways to go infinite red mana. Let me read Desecrated Tomb, because I don't think most people know this one. It's three mana for an artifact. Whenever one or more creatures your cards leave your graveyard create a one one black bat creature token of flying so the phoenix would be in your graveyard you cast your commander it comes out of your graveyard creates a bat and it's on the battlefield now and if you and have a sack commander. outlet yep you sack that and maybe sack squee mm-hmm. squee their mortal since you can cast it from exile that would maybe give you the mana to recast squee from get the, the world phoenix back make infinite bats basically bats or infinite or, mana because you right. can just keep sacking them over and over again because squee's never going to have commander tax so i think runaway steamkin has a potential here as well because you every time you cast a red spell it gets some mana but yeah it's is it worth jumping through all those hoops to make skyfire phoenix work if you're a johnny yeah maybe yeah <laughs> i don't know i'm a johnny but that just feels like a lot yeah it is. it's a lot <laughs> all right the next uh card on the list is wildfire devils three and a red for a four two devil when it enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep so this will trigger when you play it and then trigger again on each of your turns basically mm-hmm. you choose a player at random can be yourself i'm i'm already out <laughs> what, what, what hold on okay all right all right 
that player that you chose at random exiles an instant or sorcery card from their graveyard. They get to choose the card. So I know it gets confusing. You yeah. choose a player at random, and then whatever player got chosen randomly, they get to, with agency, pick a, <laughs> an, an instant or sorcery card in their graveyard, and then you copy that card, and you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. Um, they exile the card from their graveyard. So you randomly choose a player, and that player chooses an instant or sorcery they've, that's in their graveyard, and then you cast it, basically. If they even have an instant or sorcery It should in their be a graveyard. random instant or sorcery in their graveyard, first of all, because having one thing, part of it be random <laughs> and one part not is really weird and confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. Yeah, but... Eh. I mean, people don't often have, like, really crappy instants and sorceries just laying around in their graveyard, right? Like, True. you don't put those in your deck, so you're going to probably get something, but a lot of times... I think the problem is most of the time when we've seen this played, and I think this would be true in a lot of games, you're getting a ramp spell. Yeah. Or the like the first a, like two times. Yeah. Or like a brainstorm. Something that's yeah. not majorly impactful, but also something that may not advance your game plan in your deck. But if you if this survives for two or three turns, it is quite a bit of value. It's just Yeah. It's a four mana four two that like might not do much at all at least it does something when it enters the battlefield but yeah the whole random and then they get to choose even if you choose yourself it's like cool but like what it, if they got a counter spell in there yeah that'd be pretty bad hey cast this <laughs> counter spell oh crud <laughs> um you know if you can find ways to duplicate this helm of the host esk effects blade of selves oh blade of selves does seem that, sweet. that seems like the best one but <laughs> yeah you, or if you have like a scavenging ooze so you can kind of like selectively target the ones you oh, want. Oh, that's a good point. You like, can get uh, rid of some cards. But is there... We'd have to ask a judge. I'm not going to make a ruling, but I don't think there's a point in time between when you randomly choose the player and when they choose the thing where you could activate the scavenging. Yeah. So you can't be like, oh, it chooses Jimmy. Hold on, before Jimmy chooses, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to exile excuse, these cards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Like, exile everything from everybody's graveyard except for that you're not going to have enough mana? Nope. Okay. Uh, all right. It's definitely wild. It's cute, but I, I don't think it's actually good. It is cute. Um, all right. Next up, we have Girids. Belligerence. We talked about this in the Rakdos deck as the first time red has the ability to populate. It's X red red for a sorcery. It deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures. Whenever a creature dealt damage this way dies this turn, populate. So you get to create more tokens. Now this has to be in the deck that wants to populate to create the token that's a copy of a creature token. A uh, deck with red that wants to populate. To my knowledge, there's only a couple, like two of those now. <laughs> yeah, there's not that many. Um, it still has a pretty cool effect that you can split the damage among any number of creatures. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost that much. Uh, I would rather just pair this up with like a Pestilent Spirit, which gives all of your instants and sorceries Death Touch. Ooh. So you can just blow everything up. At the same time, you could also just play a board wipe. That's true, actually, because <laughs> six mana. No, no, because a board wipe usually kills your own stuff. Right, 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 right. So, okay. you know, six mana kill four things. All of the, There's that card we're going to talk about later. That's six mana, kill four things. Right. And you don't, that one card does that. Like, yeah. you don't need to also, I guess it doesn't populate you. So, no. you and can, this could be seven mana, kill five things with, mm -hmm. again, with Pestilent Spirit out. You can also target your own stuff if that matters. I don't know. It's, this seems like another one of those, like, fun Johnny cards that will be awesome in that deck. Whatever that token, you the, the populate token red yeah. deck is. Yeah. The fact that it only hits creatures makes it tough i think it could have been just red x yeah and been fine because you can't have players faces with it yeah uh yeah okay oh and also sorry this is in the naya deck not the rakdos deck i apologize naya, right right yeah 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 uh all right the next card is tectonic hellion five red red for an eight five hellion with haste it says whenever tectonic hellion attacks each player who controls the most lands sacrifices two lands yeah we talked about this one at length as well it just costs too much, and it's not great. Because what if you're the player with the most lands? At seven mana, it doesn't equalize, because if you have less lands than everybody else, which is when this is good, yeah. it means you're getting it out way late. By the, <laughs> right? You Unless got, you mana ramp it out with rocks or something, but still, it's like, Ugh. Yeah, I guess you have to specifically use mana ramp that's not land ramp to get this out early. Or reanimate it or do something. The haste does matter here, but I don't know. This is one of those cards that's just going to get people to hate you more than anything else, I think, too. I think this effect like of trying to equalize the ramp in the other direction. So red's right. got a problem with ramp. Rather than give red ramp, can we give red a way to take away what the other players have ramped? At seven mana. But that's the problem. This is not good at the point in the curve that they put it. You need to put it at like four and five. So it's like the cultivate and rampant growths get punished at that point. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, eh, not a fan. Not a fan. Red's not had amazing things. Red, isolated by itself so far, pretty good, but compared to everything else, it's not too hot. Uh, next up is Hate Mirage. It's in two of the decks. Two of the decks, that's right. Uh, three and a red for a sorcery. Choose up to two target creatures you don't control. For each of those creatures, create a token that's a copy of that creature. Those tokens gain haste. Exile them at the beginning of the next end step. Well, Sundial the Infinite has a lot to say about that. Yeah, that's true. You just get to keep them forever. You don't have to do the exile at the beginning. If you Sundial the Infinite is an artifact that you tap uh, and it says end the turn. Yeah. So it kind of gets rid of all these triggers that are laying around out there. Yeah, if you can populate the tokens as well, then it means you get permanent ones that don't die at the end of the next end step. Um, Riku of two reflections as well. You can maybe get a lot of them and you can create a oh, bunch of copies of them. Spell. So you yeah. can fork it and then copy the tokens. Oh, it's a non-token oh, entering. Non-token? So you can only oh, fork the instant side, the sorcery side of it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, still, it, still, you get four instead of yeah. two, which is pretty good. I like this better than the populate specific cards because at least you can choose two really powerful creatures. And but, but the main thing is, can you keep them alive? Right. But populate, but like making copies of somebody's um, like Eldrazi or something, and then populating that so that that sticks around, and right. then swinging with the two Eldrazi's that you made or whatever yeah. is still pretty powerful. I do like you have Brutaclad down here. Brutaclad. Brutaclad. Getting men- a lot of mentions in this episode. Yeah, um, it's number two for Brutaclad. <laughs> uh, this is really good because again you make a copy of a real creature and then turn all your tokens into that real that creature thing, yeah. yeah so i could see that sort of being a thing otherwise it's sort of just like the one of those out of nowhere hit everyone for a lot of damage kind of things that there's plenty of games though and plenty of points in games where you look around that card's not gonna do much yeah like there's not a big scary creature like imagine if somebody board wipes or a couple pinpoint removal spells and you're just holding that being like i hope some somebody plays something scary yeah and it doesn't come at me <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, at the very least, uh, it has upside, and it will occasionally do big things. As I guess every magic card can have that upside, huh? Oh, most of the ones that cost like five plus mana. Yeah. I mean, maybe not like a five mana four four vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're into black cards now. Yep. And black has a some interesting stuff in here. The first is the Curse of Fool's Wisdom. This guy's just having a bad day. He is. That book is going after him. I know. He shouldn't have opened it. Four black, black, <laughs> enchantment or a curse to enchant a player. And whenever enchanted player draws a card, they lose two life and you gain two life. And you can madness this out for three and a black. So you can discard it and cast it at instant speed for uh, two mana less than it would cost normally. It's a lot. It is a lot, but there are a lot of interesting combos with it. Um, right. This, I think, goes into a Nekasar deck, I, must, I would assume. I'm not sure. I... It's interesting because it only hits one player. Yeah. That's the tough part about it. Uh, the fact that it has madness changes it a little because you could instant speed do it. Mm-hmm. So imagine somebody casts Wheel of Fortune and in response to that. <laughs> they lose 14 life. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to gain 14. Yeah. And so the madness giving it instant speed, I think I think you will need ways to madness it to really be able to play this card because six mana, unacceptable for it. Yeah. You can also target yourself with it, which is interesting. Uh, if you combine this with Villas Broker of Blood, who has the text, whenever you lose life, draw oh. that many cards, you... Because you gain the life. You gain the life. So you stay at the same life total, but, but you, you immediately draw. draw your deck. Holy cow, I never thought of that. That <laughs> so you is gotta, cool. You have to like lab yeah, maniac because, it or something. Because you but... lose two life, you gain two life, and then you draw a card. You draw two but cards. But then you draw two cards because you lost life. And then when you draw those cards, you lose two life and gain two life. Yeah. And then that just sight that, oh, will you just die though? No, 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 because you always gain the two life back whenever you draw a card because you're choosing yourself. No, no, I yourself. mean, we just draw your entire deck. Is Where do you, how oh, do you oh, not yeah, draw? Yeah. You, you'd you have to get rid or counter a trigger or something or have a Lab Maniac out. But these two cards together means your whole deck's in your hand. I guess for one of those draws near the end, you eventually get to a point where you draw a removal spell and then you You can get rid of your own Villas. Villas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully you're playing Lab Maniac. Um, yeah, true. You can no, also, don't play Lab Maniac. It's so boring. <laughs> you can also play this with Drogue Skull Reaver, which is whenever you gain life, draw a card. So you can do the same thing to yourself, but you won't... Uh, well, you would also deck yourself. <laughs> you still... But as long as one of those things you draw at some point in there is a removal spell. Well, yeah. after not too many triggers has happened. Yep. I don't know. That gets confusing. Yeah, interesting card, though. Uh, I, I don't see this seeing much play outside of very specifically people doing it for this kind of mm-hmm. effect or more and more sort of casual tables. Because this will have a big effect over the course of a game if you just put it on someone. But It I, could. It depends. But yeah, those people that play, play like Consecrated Sphinx or whatever. But that's May, yeah. right? So they can stop. Yeah. I think you just need to... Rhystic Study... Yeah, it, it can kind Everyone of... Everyone, like, let's not pay. Let's just kill him. Yeah, th- I think there are a lot of better ways to punish card draw, though, than a card that costs six mana that you could maybe madness out for cheaper. Yeah, it feels like it just costs too much mana. Yeah. 
All right, the next card is Bone Miser, four and a black for a four four zombie wizard. It says whenever you discard a creature card, create a two two black zombie creature token. Whenever you discard a land card, add black black to your mana pool. Whenever you discard a non creature non land card, draw a card. So this is the reverse waste knot. Whereas waste knot cares what or gives you bonuses when your opponents, opponents discard yeah. ca- cards. This gives you bonuses when you discard cards. Uh, if you have a way to instantly discard lands and just draw get mana it's pretty nice or if you have a lot of flashback spells non-creature non-lands you're going to draw cards off that too so each card that has uh, an incident or source or an enchantment has cycling on yeah. it which is kind of cool if you can just disc- have a discard have it outlet. for free yeah you yeah. need a free discard outlet to really do cool stuff with this but once you do i think you're in business because this is pretty powerful you're getting resources for Anytime you're getting something and using a resource that isn't the normal resources of the game, right? right. So it, we see that anytime you use life to create to do stuff, it's very powerful. Mm-hmm. Well, this is using cards, not mana, to sort of get bonuses, get resources, and, yeah. and it can be powerful, I'm sure. Yeah, Verena Lich Queen is one that people brought up uh, as a card that's going to want you. It's a zombie as well, Bone Miser. So you're going to discard cards already with Verena, and then now you're going to get extra zombies out of it, or extra mana, or extra cards to draw. So that seems like an interesting combo. Mm-hmm. Scourge Familiar is one of the best, I think, discard outlets. Uh, four and a black for flying. You can just discard the card to add black mana. So now you could get a lot of mana off of doing something like this. Oh, wow. I feel like it's one of those times where you just want to, it's it's like one of those like all or nothing turns. You just dump it all out and then you get a ton of value or you're going to want to be a little bit slower with the Bone Miser to just sort of cycle other cards. I mean, if you pair it up with wheel effects too. Yeah, totally. Then all of a sudden you're just getting a lot of incidental value. Like I wheel of fortune and <laughs> I then did. I happen to end up with like four extra mana, draw mm-hmm. through, you know, instead of drawing back up to seven, I draw 10. 10 and then I get like two zombies out of it. Like... Just that right there is pretty good. Yeah, and the zombies are also untapped, so mm-hmm. that's, that's maybe something there. Um, there's Last Rites. Two in the black, discard any number of cards. Target player reveals their hand, and you choose a non-land card from it. For each card you discard this way, that player discards those cards. Wow. So this could just, like, one player hosing. I don't recommend this, by the way. <laughs> but if you did have the Bone Miser and Waste Not Out, yeah. this, then Last Rites becomes, like, a bomb. Yeah, well, speaking of that, if you have Bone Miser and Waste Not Out, then Awaken the Erstwhile oh, becomes yeah. really well. Oh, yeah, one you put down. Yeah, it's three black, black. Each pl- It's a sorcery. Each player discard- discards all cards in their hand and then creates that many 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens. So You with- might just get more zombies than everyone else. And you're going to end up with some cards, probably. Yeah, and some mana. Yeah, so it, it could be very good for you. Uh, there's Mind Over Matter, too. Blue, blue, blue. An enchantment. Discard a card. You may tap or untap target artifact, creature, or land. That Pretty card's just well. broken by yeah. itself. And so <laughs> if you're getting also getting zombies and stuff with it. Uh, shout out to Gavin Verhey, who designed Sire of Insanity, which makes everyone discard their hand at the beginning of each end step. So if you're really looking to make some friends, Bone Miser, he's the one for you. <laughs> I think it's the same character that's on Waste Not as well. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, but oh. it's, it's the creature version. Got it. So... Yeah, I think the card can be powerful in the right deck. It's obviously not something that can go in every deck. I think it's cool design, though, that they made yeah. the character version. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm a fan of that. All right, next up, we have the Archfiend of Spite. Five black black for a creature demon that's a 6-6 six, six with flying. Whenever a source a, an opponent controls deals damage to Archfiend of Spice, that source's controller loses that much life unless they sacrifice that many permanents. And, of course, you can madness this out for three black black, so five mana instead of seven. So, so they really don't want to block it. Yeah, the, or they really don't want to attack you knowing that you could flash this out oh, it's a and good. put it in front. And also, then, if you just have it out, they don't want to attack if it's untapped, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually an interesting card. It's like Black's version of propaganda. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I guess. It's not quite as not good. Not really, yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing is they can just choose to lose life. True, but it could be a lot, right? Yeah, six damage. Loses that much life. So yeah, it could be... Well, no, because if they attack you with something huge. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because it only has six toughness, but if it gets hit by a 12-12, that's still 12 they're going to have to take. deal damage to the yeah. yeah, so it's always, it's, it's spiting them, right? I guess that's very flavorful. Um, some cool cards that go along with this Uvenvald Tracker is a green mana for a 1-1, one, one, but you pay one in a green, and target creature you control fights another target creature. Okay, so you can just... You not only to... kill one of their small creatures, but also either make them take damage or... Yeah. You know, yep. 
uh, Frontier Siege has, it's an enchantment that you get to choose two options, but the second one has, uh, whenever a creature with flying enters the battlefield under control, you may have it fight another target creature you don't control. So you're just playing the Archfiend, which is wah wah, something yeah. else. You kind of probably want to be blinking it to keep doing that. Yeah, it's kind of like a one time effect, though. I, I don't know. I'm not super excited about the Archfiend. No. No. It's no. felt. It feels like they're trying to make madness cards that are reasonable because madness can very easily be broken if they're not careful. Yeah. Because of the ability to play it at instant speed and also get card advantage while you're playing it. Mm -hmm. Like all madness cards kind of have flash and draw a card tacked onto them. Yeah. So they have to be real careful with the design. And it feels like it's real easy. And that's probably why most madness cards are kind of mediocre because it's just better safe than sorry. Yeah. And this is kind of going like the, this is our Phyrexian Obliterator madness card. Yes. That's not as good in a lot of ways. <laughs> All right. The next black card is Nightmare Unmaking. Three black, black for sorcery. You choose one of the following two options. Exile each creature with power greater than the number of cards in your hand. Or exile each creature with power less than the number of cards in your hand. So you either, if, let's say I have three cards. Mm -hmm. So either I exile all the creatures with power four or greater or all the creatures with power three or less, right? Uh, less than the number of cards, so two or less. Oh, so you could never hit the exact number. Yeah. So if I have three cards in my hand. If you want to hit the exact three, number, you'd three have power to discard creatures are down living. or find yeah. a way to draw a card. Okay. Yeah. But it is exiling in black, which is kind of cool for a five mana thing. In the discard deck, you can control when this happens. I actually think this card's pretty spicy. Also, often you just have nine cards in your hand. Yeah. And you're just destroying all creatures with power less than nine, which is all creatures for all intents and purposes. Yeah. And it's exile. So, right. yeah, I do think this card's good. I mean, you have cards like Necropotence in black. So, right. You know, it's not that hard to be up to 12, 13 cards, and this is just straight up exile all creatures. Yeah, and if you are a discard deck, you can get down to zero and just get everything on the other side as well going upwards. Or, or if you, you could a... be like, oh, I've got a 5-5 five, five yeah. that I want to keep around, and so I'm going to do it for four if I just control my hand a little here. Yeah, like zombie infestation, <clears throat> you can discard cards, but two twos on the battlefield, so you just keep two creatures, two twos on the battlefield, and then go upwards, you know, three and up. That's so, cool. You know, so you got some things that can work there. Next up. The Thieving Amalgam, which may be in my list of... It's cool. One of my favorite cards in the deck and the new cards. It's five black black for a six seven creature ape snake. <laughs> Players rejoice. They made one. <laughs> but everyone is just clamoring just, for the ape snake, you know? Yeah, it's crazy. Boy, all those people on Reddit can just finally sleep happy. <laughs> Twitter's never For seen years, something trend like, this hard before. Why won't they make an ape snake? <laughs> oh, finally, my ape snake tribal deck has got found its missing piece. Its only piece. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, you manifest the top card of that player's library. So you put it onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature, and you can turn it face up at any time for its mana cost if it's a creature card. And whenever a creature you control but don't own dies, its owner loses two life and you gain two life. So this is something people get confused about a lot. You can control a creature but not own it. If you steal it from someone else, yep. they're the owner, you're the controller. So every single upkeep, each opponent's upkeep, not your own, you take the top card of their library and put it onto the battlefield under your control. And upside down. Upside down, yeah. And then when, well, there's a lot of upsides and yeah. downsides. And then when that creature dies, downside for them, they lose two life, you gain two life. And if it is a creature, it's manifested. So you could pay the mana cost if you have the right mana, mm -hmm. flip it up, and it actually will become better than a 2-2. It'll become whatever it actually is. Like, yeah. if it's an Oracle of Moldiah, and you happen to be playing green with your black, you can just pay the four mana, flip it up, and now you've got an Oracle of Moldiah. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So there is additional upside of getting useful, not just two twos, And honestly, like... A card that just said create a 2-2 on each of your opponent's turn is pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good by itself. It yeah. costs a lot, but maybe you can reanimate it or play it in a five-color deck so you can always play those cards. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see this being in the send triplets deck is a nice flavorful ad. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of anti-tutor tech too, so right. it's difficult for them to do the thing where they, uh, like mystical, vampiric, they can, they just have to time it correctly. Yeah. But if they did that and then you played Thieving Amalgam, you're going to get the card they tutored for, right? Because they're not going to draw it until their yeah. draw step, you're going to get it during their upkeep. That makes a card like Scheming Symmetry seem a lot better, which was one of the new tutors in oh, black yeah. that has this sort of like a weird downside. It's black for a sorcery, choose two target players, so you can choose yourself. Each of them searches their library for a card and then shovels their library and puts that card on top of it. So you can Scheming Symmetry with the Thieving Amalgam out and they're probably not going to get access to that card. So here's the play. You make some kind of deal like, hey, I got this thing that'll let you tutor for something. Yeah. If I cast it on you, will you XYZ? Sure, okay, cast it. Thieving Amalgam. <laughs> 
you still gotta uphold your bargain yeah, like yeah, i did you, what i said hey can you get that one creature the only one in your deck i can cast <laughs> yeah uh just because it'd be really good on this board stick. yeah you should get a seedborn muse because that'd be really good <laughs> 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 uh i think you want to put this in decks like this is, seems really good in like a send triplets deck or yeah. something that's going to create mana outside of its color identity because you can't flip up the manifest unless you just happen to have the right colors. Mm -hmm. So if you got City of Brass, Birds of Paradise, Felwar Stones, stuff like that, Exotic Orchards, then you have a chance to actually create mana outside of your color identity and to maybe flip cast up the thing. Yeah, to flip up manifest that that's you know, are even up. more insane if that yeah. happens. Uh, and a shout out to Marchesa, my favorite commander, because if you get a plus one plus one counter on those cards, they become yours when they die. Yeah. They go to the graveyard, but because they have the plus they one plus one counter, your they, they come yeah. under your control, yeah, which is one of the great parts about that commander. So very interesting. You also, I think you want sack outlets because of the fact that they ding your opponents when they die, Yeah, which right. is actually a big thing. When we played the pre-cons against each other, when people would get this out, if it lived for very long, sometimes they would have like four of your cards as manifested creatures, and you'd be <laughs> like, that's eight damage. Like, yeah. that's a lot. I don't actually want to attack them because they'll just block with them. Yeah, if you have a sack outlet, it's almost unavoidable. Yeah. Uh, all right, the next one is the first ever aura that's a morph. I think there have been enchantments, but I think this is the first aura. I Mor hope I'm right about that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It's Gift of Doom, four and a black for an enchantment aura, enchant creature. Enchanted creature has death touch and indestructible. It has morph, so you can play it face down as a 2-2 two -two, and then flip or for three mana, and then you can flip it up for its morph cost, and its morph cost is sacrifice another creature. That's cool. Yeah. I love morph costs that are, are like... not mana. Yeah, or like Ruthless Ripper was reveal a card from your hand kind of thing. And then as Gift of Doom is turned face up, you may attach it to a creature. Yeah. You kind of have to, otherwise it just goes straight to the, uh, the graveyard as it's an enchantment aura. But the aura... See, it's an interesting thing because morph is a special action. Yeah. And it says as it's turned face up, you may attach it to a creature. You can't respond to it, right? You can't respond to it, but you also can stop things like Cross and Grips with this, right? Because it's a special action, doesn't use the stack. Oh, yeah. If someone has a split second spell on something, you can unmorph You still. can actually unmorph oh, still, yeah, because you're yeah. just, the morph cost, it, it's a special action. It's one I'm of those weird. I'm going to give that indestructible. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, oh crap, you actually stopped a card that we all thought was unstoppable. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, if you have it, on a Deathmiss Raptor, they were having a discussion on the rules on Reddit. So Deathmiss Raptor says, whenever a permanent you control is turned face up, you may return Deathmiss Raptor from your graveyard to the battlefield face up or face down. So you can actually So if Deathmiss Raptor is in your graveyard. Or even on the battlefield, you can oh. sacrifice the Raptor to the Gift of Doom, and because of the way it interacts with the stack, it's going to see the Raptor in the graveyard. The so Raptor back. come back and it can attach to it the Raptor? It can attach to that or anything else. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's really good with Death Mist Raptor because it pays the cost and becomes the target of the thing if you want it to. Yeah, it's also very good uh, in, I think, Aristocrats decks because mm -hmm. you, you need to protect your you know, your main guy that's doing all the aristocrat stuff and you want creatures to die and sacrifice to get those chains going. Yeah, that's a really good point. So. And, and it, yeah, it's it's pretty good protection and like it doesn't have to just be in a morph deck. It can be right. in a lot of different decks because right, right, right. it's like even it's better than instant speed protection for a thing kind of. Yeah, it's three mana, two to morph it face down. And I, a lot of decks want to have a way to sacrifice something at instant speed. Yeah. Or in this case, special action speed. Honestly, yeah. A lot of times it's like, just for the simple fact of like, they go to steal your thing and you're like, nope, I'd rather it was dead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that card. I do too. I don't like the next one. Yeah, it's Mire and Misery. It's sort of Black's way of now dealing with enchantments in two decks. Sort of. One in a black for a sorcery. Each opponent sacrifices a creature or enchantment keyword being or here so much better if you can board wipe beforehand but in general uh, uh, why didn't it say each nah. choose one each opponent sacrifices a creature or each opponent sacrifices an enchantment uh, that'd, be that'd be way better yeah because most of the time what you want this for is to hit the enchantment but they're just not going to sack that they're going to sack a creature yeah and if ever the enchantment is the least important thing for them then they'll do it but that means in that case you wanted them to sack the creature i'd rather just play scour from existence which is a colorless way to exile a permanent yeah i mean that costs seven and yeah, this but costs it's two yeah and this requires Edict a of fix are yeah. tough they're really good against Voltron decks, right? This is not good against a Voltron deck because they'll just sacrifice one of the enchantments. Enchantments on the Voltron creature, yeah. Yeah, so I just... I'm not sure what deck wants this card. The only one I could think of was Thraxymundar because you're already making them sack creatures, so maybe they don't have enough creatures and they have to get rid of their enchantment. Don't play this card. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to white now. <laughs> uh, this first one's pretty interesting. Yeah, I like it. It's four white white for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a spell, populate. 
Yeah. That's six mana. It's a big do nothing enchantment when it first lands. But it is pretty powerful. Whenever you cast a spell, populate. Now you need to resolve, they can counter it, but you're still casting it's an on cast trigger. Um, Sigil of the Empty Throne is an enchantment that whenever you cast an enchantment spell, create a 4 4 white angel creature token with flying. And that goes in basically every enchantment deck ever. Yeah, so you go turn five Sigil, turn six Song of the World Soul, get a 4 4, and now you have a populate target. So that works out well. I think this is just very powerful. Oh, yeah, it's inexorable tide, basically. Inexorable tide for... Yeah, you can... For, but not for proliferate. Yeah, yeah, not for proliferate. Now it's for populate instead. I mean, the thing I think you can do is you play this, and then you can play, like, two or three spells on your next turn and really, like, go off, because yeah. populate tokens tend to be large. So I think if your deck is built around populate specifically, this is probably going in there. But regular token decks don't want it. You'd no. rather just play token doublers. But the power level, I'd say, on this one is actually really high. Yeah. It just does cost a lot of mana. But again, maybe like for the mono white deck that's trying to do some crazy things, maybe this is a way for you to just sort of get over the edge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I try to look at all these in mono white because, or the mono colors that they can represent just because in general, they're not that incredible. Like nothing is blowing our mind so far. Yeah, populate as a mono white deck, it doesn't seem like doable. You're gonna always have to have green in there somewhere, yeah, right? Yeah, some kind of crazy Yeah, now tokens. you can have red too, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a very strong card, but it's narrow in its usage. Yeah, which actually might be a good design yeah. instead of something that breaks the format. That's just, just like goes in every white yeah, deck. It's yeah, it's all yeah. It's <laughs> there have been a couple of those. <laughs> they make they make treasures. <laughs> Commander's Insignia is an interesting one. Two white, white for an enchantment. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. So from the command zone specifically, it's a anthem that gets better and better the more you cast your commander. You need to put this in decks that want to do it. And unfortunately, the one I thought it was like, oh, Skullbriar, but it doesn't have white in it. So that, yeah, that makes it tough. I mean, again, partner commanders. I like that. Because the thing about partners is we'll count both partners. So even if neither died, you'll probably get at least two casts, one of each mm -hmm. in the game. That's pretty easy to do. In that case, it's giving plus two, plus two to your whole team. And it's if you cast them again, great. plus three, plus three? I think at three, plus three, plus three, you're pretty happy, right? Four mana, Anthem, yeah. give my team plus three, plus three. That's above rate. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. People are saying Reese the Redeemed is good for this yeah. as well. Because um, it's cheap. I like Merith actually, because it's, again, it's a commander you want to cast a lot, and then you can make little plus one, plus one, gu you can make little creatures for Oh, yeah, him. or you ping stuff. Yeah, and so those creatures are going to be bigger and bigger because of your commander's insignia, and then you're going to recast Merith. They're going to get bigger and bigger. Oh, yeah, that's true, because Merith does also makes tokens that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And Merith can kill herself. Yes. So by taking the, all the tokens off. That her. allows you to recast it, get. So if you want to. Like, oh, I wish my anthem was a little bit bigger. Right. I can get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, again, it's got some narrow usage, but it's not, like, inherently very, extremely yeah. powerful or anything. This next one's interesting, and they've been doing this more and more. It's Savine's Reclamation, two and a white for a sorcery. Return target permanent card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. If this spell was cast from a graveyard, you may copy this spell and choose new target for the copy, and its flashback cost is four and a white. So you can pay four and a white if it's in your graveyard and mm -hmm. exile it and then cast it and you'll get two CMC three or less things from your graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah. They've been sort of planting these and they just did brought back in M20, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is another way to get things that have died or gone to the graveyard this turn back onto the battlefield. And I think this is all meant to be sneaky white ramp with fetch mm -hmm. lands. So this is a three CMC spell that can get a fetch land back because that is three CMC or less. So rampant growth for three in mono white. Yeah, onto the battlefield. But then also for five mana, it's explosive vegetation because you could get two. Now you have to have right. enough fetch lands or or lands in your graveyard. You Maybe cycling lands would work too. But I think this is maybe if they keep doing this, this can get mono white to the point where it can do some tricky stuff and actually keep up in the mana ramp category. Yeah, this is this screams combo potential over it for having, f for five mana, you can choose two targets. Mm -hmm. And it's a target permanent, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and I think for the brewers out there, it's one of those cards that could be really interesting. I'd like to know if you guys have any comments about how you might abuse this. Let us know. All right, next up, Mandate of Peace. One in the white for an instant. Cast the spell only during combat. Your opponents can't cast spells this turn. And, really interesting text, end the combat phase. So remove all attackers and blocks from combat. Exile all spells and abilities from the stack, including this spell. So it's a weird fog. Yeah, it's a weird fog. But it's also tech against constant mists. Because they cast constant mists and you're like, wow, end the combat phase. You lose your constant mists. You can't 
uh, you can't buy it back, I don't even think, because you just remove everything from the combat. Ending the combat phase is important. If someone psych riffs to you swinging out with everything, this oh, gets rid protection, of protection, maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it would save them from that attack, but maybe they're not gone for the next two players' turn. Yeah, specifically, it's removing things from the stack, so it's kind of cool that it at least gets rid of some of those bigger things. If you can Isochron Scepter it, it's pretty good, too. Oh, that's true. Okay, so yeah, Psych Rift is often used because people want to wait until you actually swing at them. Uh -huh. And so you make them do that, and then you kind of counter their Cyclonic Rift that way. Yeah. All right, all right. That alone, because Cyclonic Rift is one of the most played cards in the format, might make it playable. And Fog Effects are much better in Commander than most people think. Yeah, it's a good Sunforger uh, target as well. Oh, yeah, If yeah. you play with Alesha and you don't want the creature you bring back to die, you can sort of play that as well. I don't know. It, there's a lot going on with this card. <laughs> Hopefully it's... I wish I said could not be countered rather than your opponents can't cast spells this turn. Actually, that is relevant because let's say you're a uh, player that goes to main phase two. They're like, all right, I'm going to cast themselves. Like, hold on, are you in your second main phase? Yeah, no. You're done with your turn. Well, they have to have gone to their combat step. Yeah, well, so as soon as they enter combat, they're like, okay, then you cool. Do it, yeah. yeah, yeah, It's like, oh, wait, are you casting your spells in main phase one or main phase two? That's sort of a weird question to ask because it kind of shows that you have something I think to the do. problem is that in Commander, a lot there's a lot less combat phases. Like, it's not... Even in 1v1, you can get people a lot more because a lot of people do go, I, yeah. go to, I go to combat, okay. I, you know, they, we're taught to in 1v1 to attack first before we do things. Yeah. People do that less in Commander. Yeah. But if you But are, you're right, because it turns off the rest of their turn. Even in their second main, they can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. So if you Isochron Scepter this, you could technically force everyone to play at main phase one, in a way. True, but then they know, they see it, it's not as bad for them. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Very, again, a lot of these cards seems like they're more situational than anything else. Next up, we got Thalia's Geist Caller, two and a white for a 3-1 human cleric with a lifelink. Whenever you cast a spell from your graveyard, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying, and you can sacrifice a spirit, and Thalia's Geist Caller gains indestructible until end of turn. So it's one of those flashback things. It's going to give you some spirits if you're able to get a lot of cards cast from your graveyard. Doesn't seem great, though. Yeah, I'm trying to think, are there any like really cool combos that work with this, like that you can endlessly cast something out of your graveyard? There is and if you have Grave Crawler. And another zombie, because Gravecrawler you can cast from your graveyard as long as you control a zombie, and then you just need a Phyrexian alter it. So you can just continually get infinite spirits, uh, just because okay. you, you sack it, cast it, sack it, cast it, sack right, it, right. cast it. A lot it. of people do that with like Perforos or something to kill you, yeah. but this could also kill you with spirits, kind of. And White Black haste, definitely has a zombie decks in Verena and all that stuff. True, true. If you have like, a, or if you're playing cards like Impact Tremors, then you can just, you know, knock them all down. Kaikar is a new one which just wants spirits in play, can can do things with them. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, turn those flashback spells into mana for more flashback spells. Yeah. Or you can Goblin Bombardment everyone out as well with all your infinite tokens. But again, mm -hmm. we're talking three card combos here that... It's definitely very fair. Yeah, it's very fair. <laughs> it's not just two cards you win the game, <laughs> as many other things can do. All right. So the next one is Doomed Artisan. It's two and a white for a 1-1 one, one human artificer. Sculptures you control can't attack or block. At the beginning of your end step... Create a colorless sculpture artifact creature token with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of sculptures you control. So it makes a sculpture on each of your end steps, and then eventually it dies, the Doomed Artisan, and that now allows your sculptures to attack and block, and hopefully you've got a few of them at that point, and they're like three threes or something. <laughs> Good job. Good job. It you took made you three four turns to make a three three, a few three threes. I mean, if you have token doublers and maybe some populate, yeah, divine visitation a, make them into bigger things, but then you're, oh, you're getting divine rid of this. visitation is way better because that now makes a four four angel every yeah, turn. But it's the end of your end step. I like the flavor that like this is such a famous painter, but he's not going to be known until he's dead, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like one of those oh, like, more famous after they're gone. Uh -huh. uh, he's a doomed artisan. It's um, just a lot of hoops to jump through to make it good. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. if you already have divine visitation, parallel lives, doubling season in your deck, then I could see this being mm -hmm. playable as a Three but mana, it's just one, one. most likely to be like make one token. Yeah, by the time it gets back around to you, I don't know. It's just it takes a while. If you a, a sculpture on everybody's turn, then yeah. we could talk. Well, like mirror weave is something that you it's can use. Too I, I don't know. There's a few ways to combo off with it, but I'm not personally very excited about this. Uh, mirror weave is two, and then white blue white blue for an instant. Each other creature becomes a copy of target non legendary creature until end of turn. So, oh, so you make all your creatures a doomed artisan, and then they all make a bajillion sculptures, but then turn back into themselves. Yeah. And then you presumably get rid of the original doomed artisan? 
Yeah, or you can just make all of your creatures, actually you make everyone's creature a sculpture so they all become big, but hopefully you have more. <laughs> I don't know. Look. Oh, it's each other creature is not your each, creature. Yeah, but not turning just their you. creatures into Doom Artisans doesn't do anything because this not their end step, right? Yeah. I mean, look. If you do it right. Okay. It's not good. This is like the fifth card now where we've been like, there are a lot of hoops to jump through, but when you do... It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next card... Oh, it's your turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cliffside Rescuer. It was so good they put it in two decks. Or is it? <laughs> One in the white for a creature core soldier 2-2 with vigilance. You can tap it and sacrifice it. Target permanent you control gains protection from each of your opponents until end of turn. So that's kind of new. You usually mm-hmm. don't see t- uh, protection from each opponent. Um, planeswalker protection, land protection, and champion protection. It's target permanent, so that's nice. It makes it immune to their removal and they can't block it, basically. Yeah. I think you would only put this in decks that you really want to protect things like doubling season or, or things that when they come out, people have to remove it, you know. But it's a one-time use card, so it doesn't seem that great. Yeah. The Mother of Runes just feels better. That's what I was going to say. Is this, this is, Mother of Runes just has to be better, right? Yeah, unless, again, it's target permanent. So it's if you're, I don't okay. know. But then again, it's like, I don't know. I, I, just, I don't I don't know. Like you, yeah, so you can co- so you can protect your enchantment, like you said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like a planeswalker or yeah. something. Would it have been know. so bad if it was like two and tap it to do that? You don't have to sacrifice it. It would have been much better, that's for sure. But I don't think that card would be broken. No, no. What if it, what if it was five mana pay it target permanent and you don't you only have to tap it? You just do it a bunch of times. That would be more I, on the edge of uh, side. I of broken. actually think that that would be worse because five mana is so much. Yeah, but let's just say you could always hold up ten mana and protect your two most important combo pieces every turn. Sure, including itself. But if you have two combo pieces, you, didn't you win already? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. We're done jumping through hoops. So green non-legendary cards. The first one, Viper Squad. Oran Frostfang, three green green for a snow creature, snake. That's oh, a snow creature. I didn't realize that. It's a two six. Attacking creatures you control have death touch. Okay. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Ooh. Ooh, indeed. A so, little Edric. Yeah, a little Edric action. This is actually the uh, part of the effects of the Bow of Nylea and the Biden of Thassa tapped, uh, put onto one card, which is kind of cool. Um, token decks might do well. You can swing with a bunch of things. They all have death touch, draw a bunch of cards. I, I, yeah, that is pretty good. I mean, a lot of times you want to turn things into resources. Any deck that's just going to have a bunch of creatures out, this could be useful. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times you're like, well, I don't know. I'll swing with two or three of these, and I'll trade a couple if I have to, get a couple cards. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Dur- Duran the Siege Tower, because it's got a big butt. It's a 2-6. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Uh, Cassetto, shout out to Prof, the Snake Master. Don't you mean Cassetto? Cassetto. <laughs> he's a one green and a blue legendary creature snake wizard it's a two two and you can pay green and blue to give a target creature unblockable and if it's a snake it gets plus two plus two until end of turn so you can you at go. least guarantee unblockable make sure you draw the cards and it yeah. hits them for a lot yeah sure I think it's just an overall solid card it's fine yeah it's definitely right in that range of if I was a player that was building a slightly more casual deck or wanted to have an attacks matter deck like this seems like a cool investment yeah alright the next one is Celestia Eulogist Two and a green for a 3-3 three, three centaur druid. You can pay two and a green, colon, so you can do that as many times as you've got two and a green. Exile target creature card from a graveyard, then populate. This is actually pretty, seems pretty strong to me. Three mana, graveyard hate, and populate. Yeah. Uh, I think scavenging ooze is almost always going to be a better choice, but if you're in a deck that has tokens, then this is one like another card you'd put in there for sure. Um, I mean, I would put this over scavenging ooze in a token deck. In a token deck, and yeah. And in a non-token deck, you would definitely not run this and run scavenging ooze. You want to want the populate. Yeah. But once you do, it becomes very strong because incidentally having the eulogist out makes it so that it's amazing having a piece of graveyard hate out on the battlefield right. just turns off many cards. You You won't know it. Because they won't cast those cards. Yeah, they're just very scared. They're like, oh, no thanks. I won't do it this time. Yeah, so that actually is is a big thing. And it's unlikely you're going to be in a game where there's not some creatures in graveyards for you to, if you just want to populate and you don't need the graveyard hate part, yeah. you still get that. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, good overall card as well. Uh, next up is full flowering. Not half flowering, not partial flowering. <laughs> the full flowering for XX in green. It's a sorcery that says populate X times. So if X is equal to two, then you're paying five mana total because two, two green, and you're going to populate twice. Hmm. Seven mana to populate three times? You know, if it's going to give you the thing that wins the game, then sure. Yeah. But otherwise, but it is expensive. If it was yeah. an instant. 
Yeah, it's good with Unbound Flourishing, which is a card that was in Modern Horizons that is an enchantment oh, for gosh. two and green. Whenever you cast a instant or sorcery or activate an ability, if that spell's mana cost or that ability's activation cost contains X, you copy it and you can choose new targets for the copy so that you get a little extra value out of this. A lot. I mean, yeah, you that means five mana populate four times. Yeah. That's actually crazy. This is obviously... you have to have Unbound Flourishing. But X, <laughs> X Tribal, I guess, wants this. Well, does X Tribal have enough populate? cards that go in it you'd have to find like hydras and ways to make tokens out of those hydras and yeah. stuff i don't know x going give it to you <laughs> <laughs> doubling season annoying procession all good cards with this kind of uh populate thing but those are sort of givens i think uh the next green card is road of return it's green green for a sorcery you choose one return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand so a little bit like regrowth mm -hmm. or you can put your commander into your hand from the command zone so you can skip commander tax but it has entwine two so if you pay green green and two you get to do both of those things return a permanent from your graveyard to your hand and put your commander into your hand from the command zone i actually like this a lot i play an animar deck and that card is removed beyond it, it just gets always it's always killed so a way to bring back a card that maybe can help him go infinite as well as putting animar in your hand seems pretty good for four mana even for two mana just re i mean that's gonna be cheaper than for instance a six eight 10 I cost. play regrowth in a lot of decks, yeah. and this is worse than regrowth because it can't get non permanents. However, if the deck I'm playing only had, say, eight or nine instances and sorceries total, then this becomes basically regrowth with the upside of sometimes I can do the thing with my commander. So I think this is actually a pretty good card because mm -hmm. that flexibility, versatility, multiple options on what a card can do. What's that word? Modal. Modal. Yep. Is is worth a lot. And the fact that you can do both means that later in the game you can get extra value. I think this is a, definitely a playable card in a lot of green yeah. decks. Especially if you have key pieces that are like permanents, either a uh, enchantment like doubling season or like a creature with an Eson deck that or a Savala deck that you need to have back out to make the combo happen again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, next up is the Voice of Many, two green green for a creature elf druid. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card for each opponent who controls fewer creatures than you. This card is just not good. Just play Harmonize. You ha it's so conditional. If you can flicker it a bunch, sure. If you're playing it in a rune deck, sure. But otherwise, I don't... Yarrick. Yarrick, right, right. It just seems like a bad harmonize otherwise, because what if you don't have more creatures? I think if Panharmonicon is in your deck, Voice of Many is going to be good. If right. Panharmonicon is not in your deck, Harmonize is probably better. Yeah. Panharmonize. Panharmonize. That's the Voice of Many. All right. The next one's interesting. I like this card, actually, but it's very expensive CMC-wise. Apex Altisaur, seven green green, nine mana for a dinosaur. It's a 10-10. Hey, that's a good rate. When Apex Altisaur enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. It will kill that creature because it's a 10-10. <laughs> but it has Enrage. So whenever it deals, it, it's dealt damage, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. So the way this plays out is you play it, you fight a creature... It kills that creature, but it, because it took damage fighting it, it triggers, and now you fight another creature. Yep, and then up it to one, so you can choose if you want to keep the chain going. Yeah, you don't nice. have to. So what you usually do is go, well, is there nine like power and toughness yeah. worth of stuff? Then I'll kill those three things, and this will still live with nine damage marked on it or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, if you find a way to give it indestructible, then it just kills everything. It's very... Yeah, that's a good point. You can uh, put the Gift of Doom on it, right? And it's going to get <laughs> indestructible and death touch. That so is, it just machine guns everything down. That's pretty awesome. At a very cheap nine mana. Also, also, if you can flicker it, very, right. very good because it's an ETB effect. So yeah. this is like an ETB creature that kills around three creatures. Yeah, that's not bad. There's like enrage effects in the dinosaur deck, so you can just ping it for one, and then all of a sudden it goes off. I'm it, actually thinking of putting it in my Tim deck. Ooh, Because nice. just ping it with Tim and then kill a thing. Yeah, then, yeah, and then yeah. You, then once uh, on your turn, it's got its damage, it's gone now. Do it again. Do it again, yeah. yeah. Seems I mean, really interesting. I think that card's deceptively powerful. Now, it's nine mana, and nine mana is the realm of expropriate, and this is card is not expropriate. No. So, like, this is a casually powerful card. This is not yeah, a... Yeah, you either yeah. cheat it out or make your dinosaurs cost less, or you can do, like, you can mimic bat it if you somehow get it out, and it oh, dies, and you just keep yeah, putting one out every turn. Yeah, it's sim it's kind of similar to your Tim tactics over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, all, right, all right, we're moving on to blue cards now. Now, this may secretly be one of the most powerful cards in the entire set. It's Sudden Substitution. Two blue blue for an instant with split second. So as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Uh, and it says exchange control of target non-creature spell and target creature. Then the spell's controller may choose new targets for it. So you kind of force a 
a perplexing chimera situation. Yeah, you give them a It creature. doesn't have to be yours. Either. You're right. You can do it to someone else and stuff. Yeah. You can just... <laughs> you, someone casts a rampant growth, and you can be like, uh, I'm going to give that to me, and then I'm going to give well, uh, you, my creature to you. Or you can choose someone else as a creature and give it to them. It's really right. interesting. But whoever's creature it is... They get the spell. You can't choose I get the spell, but you yeah. get their creature. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Unless you are the one that gets it. Now, this pairs really well if you're giving your own stuff with Homeward Path. Oh, you're just like, I'm going to get that creature back. Or yeah, get back, yeah. rune, blink, blinky stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. those come back to owner's control usually. Yeah, you put Puka's Mischief on here, which I thought was really interesting. One yeah, Puka's Mischief is three and a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may exchange control of target non-land permanent you control and target non-land permanent opponent controls with an equal or lesser converted mana cost. So you can get your creature back if you have to with giving them something else, basically. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really interesting is that you can also give people cards that you cast that end the game oh, for them. Oh, I didn't even think of this. So people were saying, oh, if someone casts like an early pact... Except for Pact of Negation, because they can counter it if you switch it. Yeah. If you cast a Pact with an upkeep trigger, you can give that to someone else that, that can't pay the mana for well, it. Like the black one, and you don't have black mana, so yeah. you're just going to die? You're just going to lose the game. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're playing red, you can cast Final Fortune and give a person another turn, but at the end of that extra turn, they lose the game. So there is an interesting thing here, and it's split <laughs> second, like, so you cast, can't even stop it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm casting Final Fortune, but I'm giving it to you, and I'll take your creature. Yeah. Good luck, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And people, like people finally found a way to play one with nothing, which is a black instant that just says discard your hand. So now you can give this to someone else. I don't know that I'm putting one with nothing or Final Fortune in a deck so that I can hopefully pair it with another <laughs> card in my deck. Like, that's not my commander. But yeah. if you already had, see, one with nothing, that that's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But Final Fortune, there are decks that do have Final Fortune and in it. And the packs as well. Yeah. yeah. So that is, yeah, that, then I would th- really think about putting it in there. And I think it's just powerful anyway. Yeah. Just to be able to give them your worst creature and get their expropriate or something. Yeah, and sometimes like someone casting a spell of to fire. give it to someone else, being like conditionally, like if you if I give this to you, can you choose better targets or even the person that cast it? And this could just host someone out of nowhere. I mean, think of how many big spells end games. Expropriate, Torment of Hellfire, Exsanguinate, Death mm-hmm. of the Deathless. I'm not saying that happens every game, but there are percentage of games where you, all of us have lost to those cards. This card is like, now I... You played that, but I win because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And if you're playing a Zedru deck, then you're going to want to give stuff to people anyway. It, it seems like a very interesting card. I'm actually pretty hyped about this one, and I can't wait to lose to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one is Wall of Stolen Identity, three and a blue for zero, zero. Shapeshifter Wall. You may have Wall of Stolen Identity. Enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it's a wall in addition to its other types and has Defender. When you do, tap the copied creature, and it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control Wall of Stolen Identity. So you so. make like a bad clone, because I don't want my clone to have Defender. But it also but it, Dungeon Guys something. Yeah, but the thing it cloned, it locks it down for the remainder of the time that it's in the game, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, super interesting, but it seems like it's only going in wall decks, right? Yeah, Arquette is the strategist. Obviously, yeah. this is a, a card that works for them. Um, you know, if you do actually have a copy of Dungeon Geist in your deck and you play this and you're tapping down two creatures because this has the text for it and the Dungeon Geist that comes in has the same text. Interesting. <laughs> so you lock down a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're stretching it. But again, I like clones. Um, Jacob, shout out to you. This may be something that you'd want to put in your deck as well because it's, it's pseudo removal. Oh, yeah. Jacob's anything you can do, I can do better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, All, right. Yeah. All right. Next up, we got Kadena's Silencer. One and a blue for a creature Naga Wizard. It's a 2 1. And of course, it's going to have Mega Morph. So you can cast it as a 2 2 creature for 3. And you can turn it face up anytime for its Mega Morph cost. And then you play a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. The Mega Morph cost is 1 in the blue. So the same to cast it. And when Kadena's Silencer is turned face up, counter all abilities your opponents control. So it's good against stopping a Planeswalker Ultimate. Yeah, that's true. Um, anytime you have a stack of multiple abilities, there aren't that many, but like Valakut, uh, if you play it and with like escape shift, oh, interesting, you get a ton of things, um, all triggers at once. That, that, yeah, that does tend to like certain decks will have one thing happen that triggers five things, so this could kind of, yeah. I mean, imagine if we had this and that one game when all of our creatures were being sacked to uh, uh the game with Kathleen and Graham when, when we just had constant when you edicts out, right? Yeah, 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 great pack or whatever. Um, yeah, Dictator of Erebos, yes, that would have been great because they all stack up at once, basically. Yeah. It's, it's a one time use, though. Same with like Aristocrats, so like I have 50 Blood Arts triggers on the stack, and be like, now you don't, right? But if they know that card's a possibility, they can just sack one creature, wait, wait, 
sack. Does it weight. resolve weight? Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's the way you sort of get around that. Interesting. It's it's a nice little tool to have in the belt of the morph deck, I suppose. Yeah. Or stop someone's fetch land if you're a true monster. <laughs> Don't do that. That's real BM. <laughs> It's like one of the I've worst had it happen. things. It was Patrick Scarborough who did it to me once. He just, Scarborough. He just had like a, it wasn't a stifle, but it was the uh, like void made husher or oh, something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. just was like, eh, just like, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Scar, Scar, Thanks, Scarborough. 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 How dare you? All right. Leadership Vacuum is the next card. It's two and a blue for an instant. Target player returns each commander that they control from the battlefield to the command zone. And then you draw a card. So this yeah. is basically the same as exile removal for a commander right yeah this two and a hoses blue. voltron decks dude yeah true because they're usually indestructible they're not mm-hmm. usually like into, gets around... into bounceable into... <laughs> one nation into bounceable <laughs> that should uh, be a thing into bounceable that's an hey morrow that's an unset mechanic into bounceable yeah oh, free that from one's free, us. That yep. one's free. Uh, yeah. this actually has ural on the art which is one of the sort of best um targets for targets for yeah. it yeah it also doesn't target them so it gets around hexproof and stuff the thing that the reason it can trips i can actually see a lot of people playing this index just it seems to have You're, they're always going to have a commander and it is the same as killing their commander, right? Because what do they do when you kill yeah. their commander? They put it back into the command zone. This is the same thing. It will They will still have to pay commander tax on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This gets Planeswalker commanders too, so it, it targets a lot of stuff. Yeah, and you're right. It gets around Hexproof and all this stuff because you're targeting a player. Yeah. So that player, like, can't... They choose one of their commanders. They can't get around. It's Well, it's tough to get around it. Yeah, it says each commander too because I think partners as well. Oh, right? we get both partners? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. I actually think that card's, you know, playable. Yeah. It's playable. Next up is Thought Sponge. It's a creature sponge. It's a 1 1 with flash for three in the blue. As flash, Thought Sponge enters the battlefield with a number of plus one, plus one counters on it, equal to the greatest number of cards an opponent has drawn this turn. And when Thought Sponge dies, draw cards equal to its power. So for four man, you're going to flash this in. Let's say Josh has only drawn his card for the turn, and that's it. It's a four mana 2 2 with flash that when it dies, you're going to draw two cards. Which is actually pretty good, honestly. Yeah, it's not bad. Like that right there is not bad, not yeah. terrible. It can block something out of nowhere, right? Yeah. And you can get extra cards out of it. Um, if you have Marchesa, it's just coming back every single time, which is pretty neat too. Um, yeah, great in Marchesa. Also, there are those turns where somebody wheels or something, and you right get a massive get nine, thought sponge. Yeah, you know, nine uh, counters on it and draw a million cards when it dies. So, you put Azuri down. I think that's another great target for this. Because it doesn't need to enter the battlefield with all the counters. You can give it power later, and then, then it'll still draw you a bunch of cards when it dies. Yeah, that's true. Rolesque as well, Apex Hybrid. It just mm-hmm. gets a lot of plus and plus and counters, and you're proliferating. Uh, and then you have the whole, like, hardened scales, doubling season, pure, pure two feet decks. Yeah. yeah, so Thought Sponge, I actually like this card a lot. I'm definitely going to put it in my Marchesa deck. Yeah, yeah, I can see it seeing some play. Yeah. It's also good just flash it in, block with it, draw a few cards. You know, drawing two cards, it's not I mean, bad. A lot of commander turns, I'd say, probably higher than the than the. Av- what do you think the average amount of cards drawn on a player's turn is? It's got to be close to two. It's probably like one point five to one two, right? Yeah. Because some players are going to be playing a weird mono red deck that just can't draw cards. Really, but most have a Phyrexian Arena or something, right? That's yeah, going to allow close them, to like, two, probably. Yeah. So, okay, the next one is Mass Diminish. It's one and a blue for a sorcery. Until your next turn, creatures target player controls have base power and toughness one one. They don't lose their abilities though. Yeah, these that's, become that's one important. Ones. And then it has flashback for three and a blue. So you can kind of do this twice in a game. Uh and we've seen this when we played the precons being useful against the um arch enemy player as far as I'm gonna turn off all their creatures mm-hmm. and then I'll do it again next turn. And hopefully by then we found an answer. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you can play Goblin Sharpshooter or oh, Pestilence, just... Pyrohemia, because they all have one toughness. Um, oh, yeah, Geared's Belligerence or whatever. Yeah, uh, yep. it's, it's a good one here because you can just hit them all for one damage. You need a lot of mana because you pay the two, then pay the two, then, yeah. Yeah, someone, one that people found online was uh, Silumgar, the Drifting Death. Oh, yeah. Really good card because whenever a dragon you control attacks, creatures defending player controls gets minus one, minus one till end of turn. So that gets around indestructible and stuff too, which is pretty neat. Uh, yeah. Oh, someone actually had another one, which is Elspeth's son's champion. You could do this to yourself. And then destroy and then creatures minus four. Three destro- right? Yeah. But, and, uh, steer stre- commands, too. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, if you had Retribution of the Meek and that kind of stuff. You we're definitely get- stretching it a little thin here. But there are combos, and I think the card is playable. All right. So we're done with the c- the colored cards, and now we're into the artifact cards. Yeah. Um, 
interesting. I actually, this might be one of my favorite cards in the set. It's, it's up there. It's, it's definitely one of the most powerful too, I think. Scroll of Fate, and it's an artifact, so every deck can play this. Three mana for an artifact. You just tap it to manifest a card from your hand. So you're putting it onto the battlefield as a 2-2 creature, and if it's a creature, you can turn it face up for its mana cost at any time. Now, this isn't card advantage because you're not manifesting the top card of your library. Right. It's a card from your hand. But it could be a land that's useless otherwise. It could also be an enchantment or something huge like Omniscience. And then all of a sudden you can use Aminatu to flicker it and turn it into a real card or Rune. any flicker effects. Rune, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just think just for three mana to always create a 2-2 out of nowhere seems really good. Just also, by itself. Also, you know, sometimes you got extra lands, a lot of cards in your hand. Then in that case, it is just creating a 2-2 for free, quote mm -hmm. unquote. Um, also, it can be a creature that they don't know how scary that creature is because they can't see it. Mm -hmm. So it can be a creature that you're intending to flip up on the end step before your turn to kind of, in a way, give it flash. Yeah. Right? Because if somebody does that, put something face down, I don't know if, as an opponent, I automatically kill it. Mm -hmm. Do you? No. I mean, unless you know the deck well enough, that's like it could be one of these three things that would really be bad for me. Yeah, because then they go, boom, flip it up, and then now it has virtual haste and that can be very powerful on a lot of cards a lot of cards need to swing or need to yeah you know so uh, I, I think this card is actually pretty good the next card i don't think is pretty good it's, it's good in the deck that you brewed potentially maybe <laughs> okay it's not that good it's pendant of prosperity three mana for an artifact it says pendant of prosperity enters the battlefield under the control of an opponent of your choice uh oh and then pay to and tap it remember this is your opponent paying two and tapping it because you've given it to one of them <laughs> um draw a card then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield again this is your opponent they pay two, tap this draw a card and then they put a land from their hand on the battlefield and then pendant of prosperity's owner that's you draws a card and then that player may put a land from their hand onto the battlefield so i play this i give it to jimmy and now i'm like i hope i guess that you spend two mana to do that yeah. A couple times. You know what? I actually am just going to sack this to a card. Yeah. Or I'll just, I, I'm just going to push this to the end of my play mat and never use it, and you just wasted a card for nothing. It, yeah, exactly. It's three mana. That's a, that's a decent thing. And it also costs two to do, which makes it even worse. Like, the other person is, they're not, if it was just tap draw card, then, like, yeah, this might be really interesting because the other, you know, you both get to do it. You can help someone out, a little group hug. Eh. I mean, you can obviously make a deal. Like, hey, I've got this card. Who's gonna use it? Who who promises to activate it? I'll give it to you. Yeah. And somebody at the table might be like, I really want that. Yeah. And I need to ramp a land out of my hand. Or let's something. do that. But even then, how long are they gonna keep doing it? How much value are you gonna get out of it? I wish at the very least this just said when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. Yeah. So you could replace the card part of it. Because in case they never activate it once. Yeah, because you could just be down a card in three mana for nothing ever happening. It's just I don't know. Yeah. Now, this card gets much better if you're able to use it on yourself because then you're drawing two cards and putting two lands on the battlefield potentially. So cards like Marisil the Pretender. Yep. Uh, when Marisil enters the battlefield, you can exile an artifact or creature card from your hand or graveyard, and then it gets a little cage counter, and then Marisil has the activated abilities of all cards you own in exile with cage counters, and you can do it once per turn. So then you can tap Marisil for two, draw two cards, put two lands on the battlefield. So it's a little bit better there. Zedru, right? It's yep. a little bit better there. And then there are cards like Brooding Saurion, uh, brand and gruel charm and memnarch which are all ways to get cards that you own back onto your battlefield oh interesting yeah so you could get control of it and now you're oh because then are you paying two and you're drawing two, two draw cards two. yeah it's, and it's putting two lands in much play? better if you have it so but if it you require can... so many hoops to jump through uh... if you're not building your deck around that idea then it just is a really weak single card edition so this may be good in a deck that's going to be able to steal artifacts basically yeah. then it's very powerful because paying two to draw two put two lands in play that's every big. turn that's insanity yeah because yeah. so memnark right it's already an artifact you can yeah. steal it back um yeah i didn't think about stealing it back but that's pretty good yeah it just takes too much to be honest i mean it the deck already has to be doing that for other reasons, and then this exactly. card slots in. Yeah. I don't think you build a deck around Pendant of Prosperity. No, you could build it around, like, the Zedru idea, which is, like, I choose who gets what and when I get it back, Homeward Path, all that stuff. But it, it just seems like a lot to jump through. There have been a lot of hoops today. There have been a lot of hoops. This next card is the first... I think it's the only card that's in all four decks, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. It's Scare Tiller. Waha! It's, it's a cool one. It's a cool one. Four mana for a 1-4... When Scaretail becomes tapped, choose one. You may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped, or you return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And you just require a Scaretail to be tapped. Not attacking, just find a way to tap it. So, and it's a 1-4, so 
you're going to be able to attack probably someone, someone yeah. at least the first, the early turns. You can get your fetch lands back. I mean, I think obviously I want to say like, you want to be setting up the graveyard to battlefield situation. The yeah, land card from your hand into play worth a lot less to you because that's not card advantage. Mm-hmm. It's ramp, but you also, there's going to be plenty of times when you just don't have a land in your hand and you don't get that. So you want a deck that's going to have lands in its graveyard. Yeah. So fetch lands or the Gitrog esque decks. Yep. Uh, but then you're going to need cards that tap it down. So like a commander like Derevi might work. Yep. Uh, Scepter of Dominance is just one of those cards that you can t- pay man to tap a permanent. So that actually has use if you don't have a Scare Teller out, at least you can tap something else down. King Makar and vehicle decks, people have said. Like yep. King Makar is a card that has inspired, which wants it to be tapped. Um, so in a vehicle deck, you can tap these creatures to crew the vehicle without having to enter them into combat. And in all the, and that's a monocolor deck. A mono white deck might want Scare Tiller. You're going to want to put the f- the fetch lands that touch white in right. there. You got Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse. But I think white is pushing towards wanting those cards anyway because it brought back and this Savine's Reclamation. All right, and right. so this might all add up together now. Again, we keep saying this, but whereas white and also maybe red mm-hmm. are starting to get a few more tools in the land ramp category, which may help them catch up uh, because white particularly is very far behind yeah. right now just as in pure power level. And it's mostly because of stuff like that. Schedule will probably mix into the Hogak deck. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of times very like a... anything that's milling itself a lot could be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a it's a cool card. I don't think it goes in every deck. And and if your deck has green already, you probably don't need uh, the uncertainty of a card like Scare Tiller. You can just play a card that's going to put lands into play like Rampant Growth. But <laughs> in the other colors, you you would think about Scare Tiller if you have a few of these other things and the fetch lands or whatever. It's four mana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I like this next one. This next one, uh, you know, mono red and mono white decks rejoice. It's two mana. It's Idol of Oblivion. It's an artifact. You can tap it to draw a card, but you can only activate this ability if you created a token this turn. Interesting. So it pairs really well with like squirrels, squirrel They just nests. decided like, you know what doesn't have enough card draw? Token decks. Not true, by the way, but okay. Well, mono white token decks, maybe. Sure. I don't know. Two mana to draw a card if you're making like a little soldier. Seems I okay. wouldn't mind if it said activate this only ability, this ability only if you control a planes. Oh, interesting. Wait, uh, that's bust. Just one free card to turn. You're not paying anything but just the two mana originally. White's the worst color. Hell of Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, but then every it's white too, deck it's plays too it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or they could have just made it one white and tap it. Draw oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to have a plane specifically. I don't know why. I don't know. Um, okay, the second <laughs> ability is eight mana, tap and sacrifice the idol of oblivion, and you create a 10 10 colorless Eldrazi creature token. Probably not going to happen. I mean, yeah. You're, putting, you're just going to have way better stuff to do with 8 mana than make yeah. a 10 ten, make you're, one You're putting ten. this in your mono white deck that only had Mentor of the Meek originally, and now you, you know, it's the one that makes a bunch of soldiers and knights, and now you can draw extra cards off it. Hooray. Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Next up, uh, this one I think people are going to find some interesting ways to abuse it. It's Aeon Engine, 5 mana artifact, enters the battlefield tapped, and you can tap it to exile Aeon Engine and reverse the game's turn order. So we played this in game nights, and we talked about it there too, but you can essentially skip a player's turn by having to go whoop, whoop, before it ever gets to them with a card like this. If you find a way to make many of these, then you are you could have infinite turns, basically, by never letting someone... You could just lock someone out of the game entirely. You can lock somebody out, but you won't have infinite turns. Someone will have to go in between you right. and... Yeah, it could be you and another player just taking all the turns, yeah. basically. Brutaclad makes another entry onto the list here with the Aeon Engine. You make a bunch of copies of the Aeon Engine. They're not going to enter the battlefield tapped. Right. You have have to make make a a token token. of the Aeon Engine. Then you turn all your tokens into it. Yeah, then you have a bunch of them. Yeah, and so you can just pass the turn, Aeon Engine. Pass the turn, Aeon Engine. Pass the turn, Aeon Engine. That means that person that's two away from you never gets a turn again, or at least not for a long time. Yeah. I don't know. That's mean. That's hoops. mean because that's going to be me. The theme, of, the theme of this episode is just hoops and how can we jump through them to make anything work. I mean, is this card good enough to play outside of like having some crazy shenanigans that are unlikely to occur in actual decks, right? Because yeah. this is good against the arch enemy player in theory because you can isolate one player for a rotation of the table and they basically, everybody else gets to go at least once and a couple of those players get to go twice before mm-hmm. that player goes. Is that Worth an it? effect that you actually want in most decks? It also enters the battlefield tap, so you can't do it immediately. So they so, see it coming. Yeah. And it, the person diagonal from you, it's the in the worst spot. Yeah, what well, if the person is right next to you instead? That'd be bad too, right? That's true. If the arch enemy is right next to you, what do you do? You have to activate it during your turn, which means you... you put yourself 
in a, a spot where you're taking... So it's a, the same amount of rotations, yeah. but you don't get an extra... It's kind of like giving yourself half an extra turn, right? Mm-hmm. If you do it during the person after you. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't... If that's... If you're just trying to ice a player out of the game, I think there are probably better ways of doing it. Yeah. I think this is interesting design. It's hard for me to see a way to really take advantage of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next card, I actually kind of like... When I read it, I didn't think it was very good. And then seeing it in play, it does some stuff. Yeah. It's Bloodthirsty Blade, two mana for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus O, oh, and is goaded, which means that it attacks each combat if able and attacks a player other than you if able. And you can pay one and attach the Bloodthirsty Blade to target creature and opponent controls. You can only activate this ability as a sorcery, so you can't attach it onto Jimmy's creature, and then when he passes the turn... Attach it to someone else, yeah. Attach it to Mel's creature, and then when she passes the turn, you can't sort of follow the turn order. But what you can do is kind of, first of all, make a creature attack. So if they've got an Orc of Moldiah or something like that mm -hmm. that would normally just sit back and accrue them value, you make them put it in combat and where it could possibly die. Second of all, just taking the most scary thing on the table and Maze pointing it away it from you. Bit, yeah. It's even better than Maze, right? Because yeah. it attacks another one of your opponents. And this is fairly cheap, right? Two mana, one to equip. That effect is actually pretty efficient, I'd say, at that. And it's reusable. So if yeah. the scary creature dies, you put it on the next scary creature. Or if the scary creature becomes the new thing they played, because, you know, that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm, Early mm -hmm. in the game, this thing's scary. Later, somebody plays something even more scary. Well, you just move this over. Yeah, it seems like it's one of those cards that you put into the Xantia decks, the ones that run yep. Assault Suit, the ones that, like, Corona and all that stuff, just because you want to mess with the combat a little bit like that. I might consider it in any deck that just wants to thwart early aggression. Mm -hmm. Or there's a lot of decks, I think, that sort of loosely just want uh, people to be mixing it up. They want Small a lot of little combats there, to be yeah. happening. And this kind of causes action to happen because somebody has to attack somebody. Well, yeah. it was goaded, yeah, but you still have two people to choose from, so that person can get a little mad, and now they're sniping at each other, and you just kind of create action. So it's yeah. fun. It's fun, and it's cheap. Yeah. One mana, not bad. All right, Empowered Auto Generator is our next artifact. Four mana for an artifact. Oh, boy, Josh and I are not fans of this one. It enters the battlefield tapped, and then you can also tap it to put a charge counter, and then you add X mana of any one color where X is the number of charge counters on Empowered Auto Generator. Four mana, you play this. Does nothing. Pass the turn. Untap. Gets back to you. You tap it for one mana. Now, yep, now the next turn. Untap untaps. it. It's a worn power stone now, the next turn. Yeah. That's two turns later. They for cost four. Four, yeah. yeah. It, the uh, third turn, it's a Thran Dynamo. Uh, the fourth turn. Well, the third turn, turn it's technically a... Uh, oh, it's a Gilded Lotus. A, a Gilded Lotus, because it's okay. a colored sure, mana, sure, sure. yeah. But one color, yeah. And the fourth turn is where you're finally... It's better than these other things. Thran, but it's worse than Thran Dynamo because you couldn't tap at the turn it came into play, right? Yeah. And if you count total mana that it's created over those turns, it's not actually equal to a Gilded Lotus till like turn six. Yeah. Because you've created one, now you've created three, now you've created six. Yeah. And That's this, two turns with Gilded Lotus and Thran Dynamo. It's not that yeah. good in proliferate decks because you have to wait a whole turn before you can even use it. That's like the big problem with this card is that it comes into the battlefield tapped. Yeah, no, I thank wish you. It, it, hmm. I don't know how they would have worded it, but if it came in untapped and immediately could tap for at least one mana, it'd be. be I think it would be playable at that point because yeah. then, yeah, sure. At that point, if you have a winding constrictor or untap effects, then you can maybe get it going. I, th I think this oh, is another a... card I would consider in my Tim deck because it has so many untap effects. So it's very possible to play this card, untap it four times, and then and then that a ton very of turn yeah. I made like seven mana. Because the interesting thing about the wording on this card, and it's easy to miss it, is that, because most cards like this work this way. You tap it to either add a counter or mm -hmm. get the mana. This does both. So you tap it, add the counter, get the mana right then. Right. So the second time you tap it, you get... Get two counter, get another counter, get, counter yeah, and get exactly. two mana, yeah. So with Winding Constrictor and some other stuff, I could see... Uh, I think you're right. I still wouldn't even put it in a Traxa, probably. It's tough. Yeah. It's just too much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was all the artifacts, and we have one land to talk about. Mm -hmm. There's only one new card that's a land in this set, and it is Sanctum of Eternity. Ooh it's a land, comes in untapped. You can tap it and uh, add colorless or diamond mana to your mana pool, or you can pay two, tap the Sanctum of Eternity, and return target commander you own from the battlefield to your hand. Activate this ability only during your turn. So... You can't even use this on other players' turn to save your thing from removal, although on your turn you can. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting it doesn't say activate only as a sorcery. It just says only on your turn. 
So you're going to be able to cast your commanders always with one recast tax on them because it costs two to use this. Um, now, if you have Zakama and 13 lands, you go infinite. Right, because it untaps. You Zakama, and then you need three lands to tap this in the Sanctum Eternity, and then you need one extra land to get that extra mana. And then you can just untap them all, keep doing this over and over again, bounce Zakama, play it again, bounce Zakama, play it again. Right, it could be less lands, even if it's like Temple have, of the False Gods, yeah, exactly. Guys' Cradles and stuff. Cool. Yeah. Um, Maelstrom Wanderer as well is really good with this card. People are saying oh, Zancha, you recast. If yeah. in case you need to mess around with where Zancha is on the table. Oh, because it's you own. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. So like that person's almost dead, let me get it back. Or yeah, that, yeah. that person's not the biggest threat now, let me put it over there. So, yeah, I, I can see this card actually seeing a lot more utility play. I like these kinds of cards because they can go on any decks, and they are, in general, just useful. Um, I don't think this goes in most decks, though, because most decks don't want to return their commander from the battlefield to their hand. Unless they haven't entered the battlefield ability. Yeah, yeah. even then, like, you generally don't want to get that by paying the full cost of the creature, but you might. Uh, and this is unlikely to save your creature because they'll just, if they have an instant, they'll just wait until not your turn, one of yeah. the other two players' turns. So Imagine it's in the Kozilek deck, though. Yeah. Or just yeah. any of the ones that make a ton of colorless mana. Or you get a ton of resources. Kozilek just draws you a bajillion cards, so that's yeah. something you you might want to do. Yeah. yeah. Interesting card. Interesting card. Okay. Okay. That's all of them. That is all, what is it, feel like 50 uh, cards? A bunch. Well, yeah, okay. That's all 50, count 50 hoops we had to jump through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move right. on to my favorite part of the episode, which is ending it soon because <laughs> these are always super long all right what is your favorite overall non-legendary card and we're also going to talk about what we think is the most powerful overall non-legendary oh, card okay i think both of mine are in black both of yours are in black your yeah. favorite and most powerful well okay I, maybe my favorite the most powerful might be colorless just because i think that makes more sense for Wait, let me look at the other for. stack really here and you can okay. vamp for a second while i i, I it's like i didn't know this that is this the section was coming show up. where we talk about cards <laughs> all of them from commander 2019 a free song for you so clearly the most powerful card is pendant of prosperity i'm just kidding <laughs> throw it out it's empowered auto generator just kidding throw it out um, I'll start. I think my favorite overall non-legendary card is probably Thieving Amalgam. It is very cool. It's so cool. It's one of the cards that has my favorite text on it, which is each opponent's something. You're making tons of 2-2s. Two you're manifesting like crazy. I, I, it's just very powerful. Um, and for me, it's my favorite sort of like kind of effect because I just think about this in Marchesa and my heart sings with joy. Yeah, I like that card a lot. Um, I think my favorite overall card is Sudden Substitution. Ah, very nice. I'm a big Perplexing Chimera fan, so this is very similar to that. And definitely turning the tables on your opponent when they do something that they think is game-winning Yeah, uh, is one of my favorite things. So I can see, and it's split seconds, just a really cool mechanic because yeah. you can feel very safe when you do it. All right, what is your vote for most powerful overall non-legendary card? I think it's very close, actually, now that you pull out Sun Substitution. I think it's either Sun Substitution or Scroll of Fate, which allows you to manifest a card from your hand just by tapping it. It may yeah. actually go to Sun Substitution, though, because you can just make someone lose out of it, out of nowhere with the Pact thing, the Pact. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I never thought of, like, Final Fortunes and stuff for Sun Substitution until you talked about it. I do like Scroll of Fate a lot. I think it's more narrow. I think Sudden Substitution can go in... Most blue decks, you right. know, you have to have some creatures. Um, even then, there's going to be usefulness when you don't have any creatures and you're switching somebody else's creature with a thing just to thwart a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go with Sudden Substitution. As your favorite and most powerful. I think Classic so. Classic Josh. Yeah. The blue player in you has yes. spoken. What do, you, what do you think is the most powerful? I probably Sudden Substitution. <laughs> 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 you're right. It has split second. It's nuts. <laughs> I think Scroll of Fate is very good. That might be up there. Gift of Doom is another honorable mention. Yeah, and I guess Dockside Extortionist yeah. as well, all sort of up there. Um, so, you know, overall... Yeah, let's let's do a recap here. What are your feelings overall on the set? C counting the legendary creatures and the new cards. Um, we've already talked about reprints, so we'll leave that for yeah. another discussion. But how do you feel about C19 overall? I'm pretty pleased with it overall in the fact that again this is a product geared towards new players and the fact that the decks play very well by themselves on their own against each other is great and that to me is like the most important part of the new player experience because you could open up the original like commander 2015 decks and try and play them and you would not have a great time the 2013 of, ones are horrible yeah they just didn't synergize with each other they didn't work uh but these decks all work and they have a bunch of cool new cards in them and i think for the most part not all the cards blew our pants off obviously 
But there was still enough in here that generated a decent amount of discussion, and I think that's cool. And they're giving help to the things that need it. So red and white are both getting new forms of card draw and card advantage. Where would you rank this in the pantheon of Commander hmm. products? Is it near the top? Is it? It's going to be in the upper 50% for sure. Uh-huh. Um, it's definitely below four-color commanders. I think it's above Planeswalker commander, monocolor decks. I mean, decks. 2016, the four-color commanders consensus best commander best, product yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah, because okay. it had the most colors, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. This maybe is like four, three or four in that area. Uh, again, I think a lot of my rating goes down to the fact that, again, the decks are playable. Yeah. And really playable, like well-built. They've been watching the Command Zone podcast, clearly. <laughs> They're not just brilliant card designers on their own, which they are. Um, yeah, I agree with w- most of what you said there. I think there are a lot of categories that you have to sort of grade it in. One of them is how good are the decks out of the box, and I believe they're excellent. This might actually be the best year as far as how good the decks are out feel of out of the box. Yeah, yeah. They're probably slightly less powerful than the four-color commanders, but they feel more cohesive along their theme. Mm-hmm. Um they all also feel very different than each other. It's hard for the four color commanders to feel super different because they share so many of the colors. Yeah, yeah. this one's like each deck is doing a thing and it feels different than what the other decks are doing. And mm-hmm. I, that made the pre con, like playing the pre cons amongst themselves, a lot probably of fun. the most enjoyable yeah. that we've done with the commander products. So they get an A in that category, I think. Another thing is reprints. I think this was solid, but not amazing. Um, but good, so I give them like a B in that category. Could it be better? Yes, but we've seen worse, so they're you know they're fine. They're in the right direction. Uh, new legendary creatures, I think, like exciting new decks to build around. I think this year is again, it's fine. I don't think it's it's amazing. There's probably like Grevin, I'm pretty excited about, but a lot of them, uh, the commanders, they feel like they're a little bit on rails. Yeah, uh, I'm less inspired maybe than I was the four color commander year with the partners was the year where like I felt like there was 50 of those decks that I wanted to build this is like two or three which is okay but not like amazing so I'd give them like a b in that category then there's the non-reprint non-legendary new cards and this year you pointed this out the whole time we were talking and it's very true the very narrow each card there wasn't a lot of cards that like this goes in a lot of decks yeah which could be seen as a downside, but it could also be seen as a good side, right? Because I think if they make a bunch of cards that like, hey, this just goes in every black deck now, and this one just goes in every red deck now, and this one, Smothering Tide, that just goes in every white deck yeah. now, we don't want that to happen very often because all the decks start to become the same if if that's the case. And so we kind of need them to be creating narrow cards that like, hey, if you're playing this kind of deck, this card goes in it. Mm-hmm. And if you're playing this kind of deck, this card goes in it, but they don't go in each other's decks because they just won't work without a, a bunch of uh, support. Yeah. And so I think that is an upside but I also don't think there's a, a bunch of brand new cards that are super, super exciting. There's a few. There's a few. So, And I'm happy for the few. But overall, yeah, you're right. It, it, I like having slightly more narrow cards. And I also think another problem of like having cards that work in every single deck is that you're going to actually see some like price gouging and things that aren't going to be happy for consumers because all of a sudden the pre-cons have become unavailable. Because this one has the this one, one card has that has one to card, fair yeah. protection. So and... like, they really have to walk a very tight balance here when they're making these decks and i I get why enfranchised players are upset that the reprint value whatever or the the power level is not there and the same spiel i made the other day it's not really intended for you to for you you're it's for newer players and if you are an enfranchised player there we're expecting you to buy the singles or just to get them one-offs not have to buy the whole deck or whatever so a lot of space here a lot of design space that they have to play with um but you know overall i've been there's guys how many products are released every single year for Magic, and how many of them have great commander cards in them? This a entire lot. year, this we've been, been like, crazy. look at Morophon, look at Modern Horizons, look at all these new things. Commander 2019 stands out as the only time they release product just for commander, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the time that they make the most broken, crazy things for commander either. I, that's actually an excellent point. And if you think about the days of yore when we were getting the crazy cards for commander, the power spike on the high end would be so high for some of the cards, the command towers and things like that. Yeah, that was in a time so. period where I think they weren't creating new cards for commander every, every single, set. single set. And so now they are doing that and they have to be a lot more careful. And also there's a lot less space for them to push in because they got to do that for Eldraine and they got to do it for the set after that and Battle Bond 2 mm-hmm. and, you know, whatever Horizons is after Modern Horizons, Modern Horizons 2 or whatever. They got to leave themselves spaces to go. And so, yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a really good point. I think this, again, yeah. What would you give C19 a grade if you were an elementary school teacher? B plus. Yeah, I mean, I'm right with you. I think it's a B plus. Solid, yeah. Not a home run, but very, very good. Yep. All right, to the listeners, 
What do you think of C19? What's your favorite new legendary card from it or your favorite non-legendary card? Mm. Yeah, what cool interaction did we completely miss and not talk about with the new cards? Yes, that I actually do want to know because I spent a long time looking up all these and I'm like, ugh. Some of these, I just hope there's something better out there for this. <laughs> and if you want to build those interactions or buy one of these pre-cons for you and your friends as a back-to-school gift, make sure you go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That is our affiliate link there and special offer right now, limited time only, if you buy any of these C19 sealed products, so any of the full decks. In the mail with that product, you're gonna get a special promo code for Lifelinker, our app that tracks life totals and magic, and you're gonna get special backgrounds that are themed to the colors of all the decks this year. So Sultai, Rakdos, Jeskai, Naya. Yeah. We really do appreciate everybody that uses that affiliate link. And also, we appreciate everybody that supports and uses Ultra Pro products. You know, they do the theme stuff for every single set. We already always mentioned that. Mm-hmm. But they also, you know, you buy this new stuff and you want it to be protected. You don't want it to be ruined. So buying Ultra Pro sleeves gives you peace of mind that your cards are going to stay in minty mint condition and be protected. They also have sweet heavy metal dice, relic yeah. tokens, wall scrolls, whatever you need to spice up your game room, your battlefield, Ultra Pro has it. All right, moving on to the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Uh, we got, let's make this something where we talk about other things that we're doing outside the world of magic that are it's, in the world of magic. <laughs> yeah, we it's st- okay. We're cheating a little fine. Yeah, yeah, Jeez, yeah. You know. We started an Instagram. Craig Blanchett is helping us run it. Uh, a lot of people have requested this in the past, and we're sort of just sort of testing our ground, testing our feet in the waters here, see what works, what doesn't. You can follow us. It's just Instagram.com slash commandcast. Same as our Twitter. We're going to be doing some cool stuff there, some magic puzzles and asking some questions, looking for some interaction. So please find us on Instagram and give us a follow. Also, Josh and I started a, another mini project, a podcast about Teamfight Tactics, which is a new game mode from League of Legends. And uh, yeah, you can find that at, if you just look up Teamfight Tactical Report. It's done in the same set. It's all on YouTube as well for videos if you guys happen to be playing that game and want to get better. Yeah, yeah, because we don't have enough projects already. Nope, 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 nope. All right, uh, another podcast you should check out is our sister podcast. It's the Masters of Modern, Alex Kessler, Ben Bateman. They talk about the more modern format and all things competitive magic. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast and right next to us at Collected.Company. Our esteemed editors are Ashlyn Rose and Craig Blanchett. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the living card animations that live behind us on set, as well as start and end our episodes at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>